welcoming and welcome to those of you who just joined the second day of the Green Hydrogen Conference. I hope you had a chance to, to join yesterday as well. So as I said, this is the second day of the conference and a quick overview of the program for today, a little bit shorter than yesterday. Um, we will start with a showcase uh, uh, with Matt Cleary from INEA Consulting. Uh, we'll share about uh, global business cases uh, for green hydrogen and also his view and the company's view on uh, what are the business cases uh, most interesting, the ones that are maybe less interesting. We had a, a lot of discussions about this yesterday and so it's very interesting to, to have a deep dive on this. It will be followed by a panel discussion really focusing on hardcore technologies around green hydrogen. Um, this panel discussion will be moderated by uh, Dr. Wu Chen, who uh, you might have seen yesterday already. And he will be joined by representatives of uh, Longi Hydrogen, Mazdar, and Fischner. Um, we will then do a, a deep dive on Algeria uh, with Dr. Bakhti, who will uh, share a little bit of perspectives on uh, uh, what's happening there in the country, uh, very hot spots uh, for global hydrogen. Um, so interesting to, to hear what is going on in Algeria. And then we will close today's session with a showcase by Alexander Rupert from Get Invest, uh, explaining us a little bit about the, the different programs and initi initiatives um, launched by the European Union around green hydrogen in Africa. So very very dense program again. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Matt Cleary from INEA Consulting. Um, based in France, he's bringing uh, almost 10 years experience specialized in energy consulting. Um, he's worked with Oliver Wyman in uh, its global energy practice previously. And his specialty is really hydrogen, energy finance, and hard to abate sectors, uh, aviation, shipping, steel. Um, so this is really an interesting point of view, a, a, um, a um, how would I say, a critical point of view on the situation about, uh, uh, about green hydrogen. And so I'm very pleased to welcome you, Matt, uh, and I look forward to, to hearing your point of view and, and your expertise uh, based on the different projects that you Work on Thanks very much, John. Thanks for the welcome. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, great to be here with you today and to have this opportunity to speak to you about um, what's a very exciting and rapidly evolving market um, in the hydrogen sector. Um, so I'm Matt Cleary. I'm a manager with um, Inea Consulting based in Paris, and I lead a lot of the work that we do on hydrogen um, in Europe. Uh, the aim for this short presentation is to give a brief um, introduction to Inea and the work that we do as well as share some of our perspectives on the hydrogen market um, based on our experiences in Europe, some of the lessons that we think can be learned and which we think might be interesting uh, as hydrogen starts to develop in the African context as well. Um, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions uh, at the end, so please do uh, get involved and, uh, and make it as interactive as possible. All right. Um, so I'll start maybe with just a few words on um, Inir Consulting. Um, so we're a, a strategy and financial advisory firm based in Paris, and we work with our clients um, to accelerate the energy and, and climate transitions. So we were founded in 2007, uh, and we work with clients across energy, um, industry, and finance to develop um, new business models, help position on new technologies, and to help decarbonize their activities. Um, we have a financial advisory practice, which provides services for firms and to raise funds or participate in M&A transactions. And we have advanced analytical capabilities to help our clients solve the most challenging um, data issues related to energy and climate as well. Um, so today we're about uh, 80 people. We've got a mix of backgrounds, so commercial, um, technical, financial, uh, which means we can really help our clients across a wide range of different um, angles. Um, we have our base in Paris, but we have a presence um, across different markets uh, globally. So uh, Asia, Australia, and now in the UK as well. And we have our capabilities across a, a wide range of different topics. So different energy and production technologies, so hydrogen, of course, um, but also closely related um, technologies and, and resources such as biogas, bio-LNG, uh, renewable energy, um, and so on. Uh, we also work in infrastructure, um, in uh, helping clients to reduce their emissions, uh, and looking at sustainability and impact um, more broadly as well. 
Um, it's also worth noting that we have a, a long-standing presence in um, Africa, so we do a lot of work on the continent. Uh, so notably uh, through our Energy Access Booster Program, uh, which helps support um, entrepreneurs working in the field of energy access in Africa and also um, in Asia. So we've got a long history of working um, with African companies and helping to develop African energy solutions. Um, quick word on our client footprint. Um, so we work with uh, energy companies and um, large industrial um, companies to help diversify their activities. So looking at new uh, energy technologies, looking at the energy transition and the opportunity that that can create from a business perspective but also looking at a decarbonization um, angle as well, so helping them to figure out how they can reduce uh, the environmental footprint of their activities, helping them to put in place strategies and solutions which help them to do so. Um, we have close relationships with financial actors, so banks and investment funds, which we think play a critical role um, in unlocking capital to facilitate the um, transition. Um, we also work with public actors, helping to define the way that markets are going to work, and we work with startups who are helping to reshape energy markets by introducing new business models and new technologies. And it goes without saying that in the hydrogen space, um, all of these actors um, play a role, uh, which is one of the most exciting things about the space. You've got a mix of incumbent energy actors and industrials and a mix of um, startups looking to kind of revolutionize the space with new technologies and new, and new models. It's one of the things that's most exciting about, um, about hydrogen. And um, so without further ado, maybe I'll just start by giving um, a couple of perspectives on the market globally, and then I'll go into this idea of the lessons that we can learn from, from the European experience. Um, so just a quick word on context in the market. So as you'll all be aware, this is a moment of huge um, excitement and hype um, in the hydrogen space. Um, so these figures show uh, from the first half of last year only the amount of new projects and um, investment that was announced um, by companies and, and by governments. And you can see that, you know, the increase is absolutely astronomical in just a few months. Um, and we think it's obviously great and we welcome the level of ambition that companies and governments are putting forwards on this topic. Um, but we do think it's worth um, just putting a word of caution um, alongside that. Um, the sector remains, the low carbon hydrogen sector remains relatively early in its development. And we think there are a few challenges that need to be resolved um, uh, for it to really scale up and, and reach maturity. Um, so three of the challenges that we list here. Um, so the first is the fact that hydrogen today, when we talk about it, is by no means a, a clean um, energy technology. Um, so a super low share of um, hydrogen from green sources or from, from blue sources, as they're called. Uh, in the market today. Hydrogen is extremely polluting, responsible for hundreds of million tons of emissions, uh, CO2 emissions each year, and focusing on reducing these emissions therefore needs to be a, a clear priority for, for the sector. The second issue we would highlight is um, continued uncertainty um, around how markets are going to evolve in the future. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, one of the ways that manifests itself is through volatility um, in share prices of companies who are acting in hydrogen. Um, there's a lot of competing technologies and um, business models and startups looking to break into this space. And I think the volatility which is observed in the prices of those companies reflects the fact that in, uh, investors aren't sure um, which technologies or which solutions are going to prevail. So, for example, some of the examples uh, listed on the page here saw growth of, you know, eight to 10 times in, in 2020, only to fall back by 20, 30, 40 uh, percent last year. So really kind of quite um, wild swings um, occurring. And the final point that we note on this page, the final challenge, is the implications of scaling up the green hydrogen sector for the wider energy landscape. Um, so here in the IEA's net, uh, net zero emission scenario, they talk about the power demand that would be required to fuel um, electrolyzers in 2050. And you can see it's almost 20% of global power demand, uh, which is in absolute terms uh, more than the US and China combined um, use today. So really kind of astronomical um, levels of demand. And that raises important questions about the cost of um, that uh, renewable electricity and also potentially social questions, political questions about uh, where the capacity will sit, um, uh, yeah, how it will take um, space physically uh, in our countries, uh, and so on and so on. So we obviously welcome the exciting moment that the sector is experiencing today, but we caution that you know, there are still challenges that need to be um, resolved uh, to get the development of the market over the line. Um, so with that word of context, um, what I wanted to talk about was um, some of our experiences um, on hydrogen from working in the European market and some of the lessons that we think can be learned from um, the European experience, uh, which might be relevant um, as hydrogen develops and scales up uh, in the African context. Um, so three points. The first, looking at demand. Um, so hydrogen has a wide range of um, potential use cases for everything from transport to mobility to, to power to a bunch of other topics. Um, and our view is that it's great, but we need to try and maintain a sense of realism and pragmatism 
about the use cases where hydrogen is generally the, the best or most effective and most efficient option, um, rather than necessarily seeing it as a miracle solution for every scenario. There are some um, opportunities which we think um, can develop in the short term, some in the longer term, and some which we think should be um, deprioritized. So more on that in a minute. Um, secondly, on supply. Um, so there's a lot of talk in the industry about reducing the production cost of hydrogen, which is clearly um, very important, but we think it's not the full story um, because the cost of final consumers includes things like transportation, storage, and distribution. So we need to reflect the full cost stack rather than just the cost of production. Um, and secondly, I know this is a, a green hydrogen conference, but we think it's also worth um, talking about the role that blue hydrogen could potentially play and um, helping to scale up markets um, in the short term. Uh, and finally, a third point about policy. Um, so governments are setting out hugely ambitious targets uh, and investment programs on hydrogen to support the development of the low hyd carbon hydrogen market, and which we think is great, but they need to go further um, in our view to help establish the kind of detailed policy frameworks, which will support markets to develop further at scale. Um, so I'm gonna talk about each of those three points uh, in a bit more detail, but the focus is really on demand, supply and, and on policy. Um, so on the demand side, um, so as I, as I mentioned, um, hydrogen, production you know, requires energy, it requires um, effort to, 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 to put into place. Um, and our view is therefore that the usage of hydrogen should focus on the applications where hydrogen is generally the best um, uh, source of the best um, energy um, form for consumption, um, rather than viewing it as a miracle solution in every scenario. So what we're gonna lay out on the page is a very illustrative um, high level view of um, some of the potential use cases of clean hydrogen and talk about the prioritization that we could give to some of those different groups of, of use cases. Um, so in Europe, the experience has been so far that a lot of the kind of large scale projects have focused on um, uh, sectors where hydrogen is already used at scale today. So you can think about refineries, you can think about chemical production, you can think about um, ammonia production for fertilizers and so on. These are um, industrial processes where hydrogen basically has no um, easy uh, replacement. And we're already using, you know, uh, millions, tens of millions of tons of hydrogen every year. And so for us, it makes perfect sense to focus on these use cases first um, to decarbonize the kind of gray hydrogen that's being used today. Um, because you already have all of the downstream demand um, infrastructure and equipment in place, you just need to swap out the production for something that's less um, polluting. So for us, this makes um, perfect sense as a, as a kind of starting point for um, clean hydrogen. And it will be, we think, similar in the African context as well. So. Um, there's a few million tons of hydrogen which is produced to produce fertilizer in, uh, for example, Egypt and Nigeria. And we think those are places where it would make sense to start looking as potential um, first cases for, for hydrogen on the continent. Um, over the next few years, um, there might be additional um, use cases for hydrogen that start to develop based on specific um, local context. Um, so it could be in, in industry. So, for example, um, green steel production or um, use in um, power generation or use in cement making. Um, industrial heat. Um, it could also be, so in Europe, we're talking about um, blending hydrogen into the natural gas network. We're talking about um, some heavy mobility applications. So for example, um, some of the densest road freight um, corridors, developing um, hydrogen filling stations to power trucks um, along those routes. Um, in the African context, that could be slightly different. So um, we know that there are projects um, in the off-road mobility space um, already, so Anglo-American um, and the kind of mining truck um, project that was talked about yesterday, I believe. Um, and you also have companies like HDF, Hydrogen de France, who are looking at hydrogen-based off-grid power solutions, which could also have a role um, in some African contexts as well. Um, so in the next few years, these are, these are kind of technologies or applications where the technology isn't perhaps perfectly ready today, but we're seeing some first trials and there could be opportunity to scale up if the kind of business case and the technological case um, makes sense. Even further out, um, we might see, so in kind of the 10 year time frame, perhaps, we might see some of these kind of large scale power to X um, type projects. So here we're converting hydrogen into um, other substances which have useful properties. So you can think about um, synthetic kerosene in the aviation space, which is, has um, very high energy density and is useful for long distance flights. You can think about converting hydrogen into ammonia or into methanol to power um, container ships or for large scale kind of export of hydrogen. Uh, and this last case is clearly one that's been talked about a lot um, in the African context. So some of the kind of super projects uh, in North Africa or in Namibia, um, those are projects which could definitely take shape uh, in a few years time. Um, but we think it will take a bit of um, a bit of time for uh, those technologies to really reach critical scale um, to, to support such a business case. Um, 
And then perhaps more, most interestingly, we think there are some use cases which um, uh, it would make sense to deprioritize in um, a lot of cases. This is going to be context specific, but we think, for example, in uh, light mobility, so passenger cars, um, it's often going to be the case that battery electric vehicles are going to be more efficient because you're not converting the, the electricity into hydrogen. They'll need to reconvert it then through a fuel cell back into electricity to power the motor. So in many cases, depending on the range and depending on the particular application, um, it might be the case that uh, battery electric vehicles are more efficient than hydrogen vehicles. And therefore, it's better to save the hydrogen uh, for other kind of more complicated, harder to carbonize sectors like uh, aviation or shipping, for example. Similarly, for residential heating in the European context, there's some talk about building dedicated you know, hydrogen distribution networks to take hydrogen to the home, to power hydrogen boilers and so on. Again, we think you know, heat pumps are likely to work um, just as well or better in, in most cases. Uh, and again, it would save the investment and the, and the hydrogen production for, for other uses. And then similarly for short-term power balancing, um, grid scale batteries are likely to do uh, a more efficient job than having um, hydrogen storage coupled with, uh, with fuel cells, for example. Um, so it's not to say that these use cases will never develop, um, but it's more to say that in the kind of, you know, immediate kind of two year, five year, 10 year time horizon, we think there are going to be other cases which develop more quickly and where it makes sense to focus um, development and business efforts. Um, all of this is very context specific. So there might be um, certain cases where it makes sense, for example, to have hydrogen being brought into the home. Um, but um, we think on the whole, uh, the, the cases towards the left are where investment and, and effort should be focused in the short or medium term. Um, this also raises an interesting point for project developers. Um, so people who are looking to develop large scale production projects. One of the big challenges that they're facing in Europe at the moment is understanding where the offtake is going to come from. So understanding who's going to offtake the hydrogen uh, and where that demand is going to come from. And that's going to be um, the same problem and the same issue, the same challenge um, in the African context as well. So thinking about where the offtake is going to be, what transport is required to get it there. All of these questions are super important to consider. All right. Um, I'm going to move on to supply. Um, so here there are a couple of points we wanted to make. Um, so the first is looking at the overall cost stack rather than just looking at the cost of production. So there's a lot of talk within the industry about trying to reach a um, dollar per kilo or a dollar and a half per kilo of, of hydrogen produced. And obviously this is super important uh, in terms of bringing costs down for consumers and helping to scale up um, some of the demand cases that we just saw on the previous page. Um, but we think that sometimes this debate um, is, uh, ignores the, the kind of downstream challenges and costs that are, that are faced uh, in getting that hydrogen to consumers and getting it into um, in our, our energy system. Um, and depending on the specific use case, depending on the production um, case, uh, that can represent this kind of transport storage and distribution um, as part of the value chain can represent quite a significant portion of the cost. Uh, and that raises challenges and questions about the way the projects are set up and the way that hydrogen is used. So in Europe, for example, there's a big debate at the moment about whether projects should be um, so centralized, so large scale projects with a transportation network which then ships hydrogen around the continent versus more decentralized projects which are built very close to demand clusters. Um, and this isn't a debate that's at all settled. It comes with it uh, a lot of discussions about the best way of transporting and storing hydrogen. So for example, we look at pipelines versus perhaps trucks versus perhaps ships for longer distances. Uh, and then within, um, within Europe, there's a big debate about how to reuse um, or the role that natural gas transportation infrastructure can play as well. So should we blend hydrogen into the natural gas network? Should we retrofit um, the natural gas network to, to support, transport hydrogen? Or should we develop um, dedicated hydrogen pipelines that uh, can transport hydrogen on their own? So there's a big debate about that and about the, the, the specific carrier of hydrogen as well. So gaseous or liquid versus ammonia, all of these, all of these debates are yet to be, yet to be resolved. Um, in the African context, it would be similar, so you need to think very carefully about the way the projects are set up, where the demand is coming from, as I just mentioned on the previous page, and understanding how the hydrogen will be transported to those um, demand use cases. It, the, the equation will be different again in Africa because, for example, there is obviously much less um, gas transportation infrastructure than in parts of Europe, um, so there's not the question about retrofitting and so on, it'll be more about is there the opportunity, does it make economic sense to develop um, dedicated hydrogen um, transportation, for example. Um, second point I wanted to make, and I alluded to it earlier on, um, this is a, obviously a green hydrogen conference, but just a word on um, the role that blue hydrogen might be able to play. Um, so the graph shows um, in the IEA's net zero emission scenario in 2050, um, the sources of um, hydrogen supply. And as you can see, almost 40% is coming from um, fossil with CCUS, so kind of what we would call blue hydrogen. Um, and we would highlight that in the, um, in the short term, uh, uh, CCUS technology can play an important role in helping to decarbonize the tens of millions of tons of um, hydrogen production that exists today. 
Um, so already in the short term, before we talk about gigawatt scale electrolyzers, starting to reduce the emissions from the hydrogen that's already been produced. Um, and it's helping to scale up the low carbon hydrogen sector that will you know, enable projects to develop and um, demand source develop as well. And in the longer term, we may also see a role for blue hydrogen uh, in some specific geographies where natural gas is very abundant and low cost, so the US or the Middle East, for example. Um, and it may also help, uh, blue hydrogen may also help to reduce the demand, power demand for electrolysis as well, which as we talked about at the start, could represent up to 20% of total demand. So it can be very, very consequential. So obviously, um, yeah, we're, we're strong advocates of green hydrogen, but we do think it's important to have a pragmatic point of view on the role that blue hydrogen can play in, in some circumstances. It might be the case in Africa as well for gas producing or coal producing um, countries too. Um, okay, final word on policy then. Um, so uh, as I talked about at the start, so governments uh, are putting in place hugely ambitious um, targets and investment programs to support the development of uh, clean hydrogen, which we obviously think is great. Um, so the EU wants to have 40 gigawatts of capacity by 2030. Um, Germany is the new coalition government that's just doubled its um, uh, target by 2030. And it's the same thing in certain African markets as well. So Egypt and Morocco on this page uh, set out uh, ambitious targets for the coming decade or decades as well. Um, however, what we would observe from the experience in Europe is that there's a gap between the ambition that's stated by policymakers and the reality on the ground where investors are delaying um, final investment decisions because they don't have clarity on the regulatory framework that's going to sit behind that to deliver those, those targets. Um, and there's a range of different um, levers and um, uh, you know, uh, enabling measures that need to be put in place. So this is a, a paper that was written by IRENA and the World Economic Forum in November. And it gives an example of yeah, what they call uh, enabling measures, um, which cover supply and demand. So um, uh, cascading down the, the macro targets that have been set into specific targets by industry or um, for specific hydrogen clusters. It includes um, financial support mechanisms, so things like contracts um, for difference on carbon, uh, things like uh, infrastructure capacity payments. Uh, it also talks about non-financial measures like standards, um, so standards on safety, standards on transportation, um, standards on carbon intensity, so defining what is clean hydrogen. And it talks about coordination across the supply chain as well, so setting production targets for things like electrolyzers, coordinating um, R&D spend, coordinating workforce strategy and so on. So there's really a lot of different um, factors that need to be put in place. And it's not to say that there won't be projects and there won't be growth without all of these things being implemented, but to reach the kind of targets in the kind of time frame that governments have set out, uh, we think it's really important that the next level of details provided, which will allow investors to kind of grow in confidence and take the decisions that, uh, that are required. All right, I'm gonna stop just a final word on the, um, the types of projects that we've been doing in the space, just to give uh, a bit more of a tangible flavor of some of the work that we're doing. So as I said at the start, we work with our clients on the strategic and operational challenges they face. So a couple of examples on the page on the strategy side here. So helping uh, a, a hydrogen project developer in Europe to define their strategy across different markets. This is very much linked to what I was saying before about finding the use cases which make sense in a particular local context. So here we went through mobility and industry, uh, and industry applications to figure out, okay, in a specific country, in a specific region, what are the applications which can make sense, helping to define and prioritize that. We did a project for an infrastructure investment fund recently looking at uh, the role of hydrogen in aviation. Here again, understanding the role that hydrogen can play and its limitations to where biofuels, for example, might be more attractive and understanding the investment in, um, in, in infrastructure, the implications that are required on that front, helping to understand some of the startups who are developing new technologies which might help to revolutionize that space. And, and then more operationally, we also help our clients to develop projects in the space. So this is an example from a logistics provider in Europe where we're helping to develop a green hydrogen project, including selecting the site, including doing the pre-feasibility study and including uh, helping get it through their investment committee. So um, we're very comfortable working across both the strategic side, but also um, on the more operational side. Um, I've talked for quite a long time, um, so very happy to have um, questions if there are any from, from the group before we close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Uh, yes, there were many comments about the great presentation, excellent points being made, and we, we do indeed have a, a few questions already, and I'm sure as we will speak, there will be more questions. Um, let's start with a question from, uh, from Michael. Your estimates out of the 100 key announced projects, how many will be realized? Yes, that's a very good question, which I'm not going to answer this directly. Um, so um, I think it's very much linked to the point I was making at the end, so about the need for more clarity on um, uh, the regulatory framework and the detailed land, the detailed kind of um, structure in which these projects will be operating. Um, so I think, you know, even this year, we're expecting in the UK and in Germany and some of the key European markets, 
um, more clarity on things like contracts for difference and things like um, carbon thresholds and so on, which will really give investors some more clarity and help them to make those final investment decisions. So it won't be all of the 130, but um, hopefully it will be a decent proportion uh, as investors get more certainty on how the market will play out. I have a question from uh, Maria. It's a rather long question, but I, I, I will read it out if you don't mind, because uh, yeah. it's an interesting logic. Um, how do you address the question of cost in the case of blue hydrogen? Um, aside from the issues related to commercializing CCS, the current cost of gas as a feedstock uh, basically eliminates the case for blue hydrogen. Um, at least that's what uh, Maria says. Um, with the extreme gas price volatility we've been seeing globally, um, and which is likely to, to continue, um, this price of gas uh, keeps increasing. So you, you were you said you were in favor of green hydrogen, but you're not excluding blue hydrogen at all. How do you address that specific point? Um, I think our view is that, so in the, in the short term, this view of um, it being an absolute must that we have to try and decarbonize the production of hydrogen today, we think that's absolutely critical. So although the gas price is high, there's still you know tens of million tons of hydrogen that we've produced this year um, uh, using gas or using even coal in some cases. And using, seeing CCUS as a way of reducing the emissions from that activity in the immediate term is absolutely critical from our perspective. Um, longer term, you're right. The, the current crisis and the impact on gas prices obviously does damage the case for um, blue or even gray hydrogen, which is obviously great for electrolysis and the renewable power sector. Um, but we still think that in certain um, uh, geographical contexts, so the US and the Middle East, for example, where natural gas is so abundant and perhaps might be a bit more disconnected or insulated from um, the effects of the effects of um, the crisis in Russia. Um, we think there could still be a role longer term for um, for blue hydrogen, but clearly it will depend on how it plays out. Obviously, uh, if the crisis um, currently accelerates uh, electrolysis and the growth of green hydrogen, um, then all the better from from our perspective. And um, maybe a last question. Um, we we had a few listeners uh, from Nigeria yesterday. We had also a presentation dedicated to, uh, to a project in Nigeria. Um, I would actually ask, uh, like to ask you, um, within the existing um, users of hydrogen, um, what would be your recommendation to, um, for them to, to consider the switch to green hydrogen? Is there any specific uh, resource they would need to look into? Any specific advice they can get from somewhere? Uh, what would you recommend them to do? So the thing that we always say is to look at, um, so when you're considering a hydrogen project, to look at all of the different elements that are required both on the supply side, but then also on the demand side. And um, so if you're a fertilizer producer today, you've probably already got all of the downstream infrastructure in place to, um, to convert the hydrogen into ammonia, to convert the ammonia into fertilizer and so on. So for there, you really need to think about the, the production element. So understanding where your um, renewable power is going to come from, understanding what size of electrolyzer you would need, understanding all of the different bits of infrastructure that you're going to need to um, store the hydrogen on site if you've not got it already, and to understand um, the economics of that solution versus um, the solution you've got in place today. So it's really about understanding the, the full kind of project economics and tech stack, uh, and then figuring out if it can make sense for you. And in, in a lot of cases now, it, it, probably won't necessarily. Um, there's going to be need to be a role for government support, um, both on the kind of structuring side, as I talked about, so the kind of regulatory framework, but also uh, in terms of funding, perhaps, to get some of these kind of flagship initial projects off the ground. Um, so have understanding what the kind of role of public support can be or um, the investment that you're able to achieve um, from other places as well. And it's going to be super important for helping these projects to get off the ground. I'll take, uh, I'll take a last question. Really, I have to make a choice because there's uh, several very interesting questions. A uh, question from James uh, with regards to policy. Um, what do you think the, is the role of government subsidies, government support? Again, there was a little bit of discussion about this yesterday. Um, and it would be interesting to get your point of view on there. Do you, do you think uh, there should be some? Uh, or do you think, on the contrary, let the market play and let the best low-hanging fruits uh, develop by themselves? First of all, good to hear from James, an old friend. Um, it, the role of government subsidies, I think, is going to be an important one. Um, so 
Uh, I think if you look at the way that renewable power has developed, I think that is perhaps a great illustration of how um, government support can really help to um, uh, provide kind of rocket fuel for an industry, really taking it from low capacity, high cost to something that's really um, at massive scale today and is, um, extremely, extremely cost competitive. Um, in the hydrogen space, so thinking about things like um, contracts for difference, which provide um, some kind of cost parity or provide um, some kind of uh, incentive for uh, lower carbon hydrogen projects. Um, those are the sorts of mechanisms we think allow um, enough support from governments to support these projects in the first place without necessarily being overly prescriptive on the exact technology or the exact way in which a project needs to be set up. So we think it's about allowing that flexibility between you know, allowing the market to decide whilst providing some certainty for investors and for project developers um, to get their projects off the ground. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Um, it uh, was very interesting. I, as I promised, yes, of course, all the other questions that have been submitted will be will be shared with you and with the others. Yeah, great. Get a chance to, to follow up with everybody individually uh, offline. Um, but we're now going to move to, to our next session. Uh, so thank you once again, Matt, for, for your presentation thank you, thank you. today. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to move to our panel discussion of the day. Um, and this panel discussion today will focus primarily on uh, green hydrogen technologies and applications. Uh, yesterday, our panel discussion was focused more on the commercial aspects. And today we have a, an amazing lineup of uh, technical experts and R&D experts uh, who will gather uh, around Dr. Wijarin from AHP, whom you've uh, heard from yesterday during the keynote. And um, for those of you who were not there yesterday, so I'll, uh, I'll read you a brief introduction uh, of Dr. Wijayan. Um, excuse me, I'll go back. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the, the hydrogen space is really interesting because it's at the crossroads of uh, professionals from, from the renewables industry and from the solar industry, we, which we are supporting. But also we have a lot of professionals coming from the oil and gas industry. And uh, this is specifically the case of uh, our moderator today. So as you can see, he's, uh, he's had a long experience uh, with some of the big names of the oil and gas space, Eni Total Technip. Um, and on top of this, he's been focusing his career on uh, disruptive engineering innovations. Um, so this is really like the perfect, uh, perfect angle to, to address the topic of green hydrogen in Africa. And so without further ado, Dr. Uwijarin, um, I welcome you to, uh, to today's presentation. I'm going to give you the co-hosting rights now. And I will let you introduce uh, your panelists today. Thank you very much, John. Um, good, good um, opportunity again to be uh, among the panels. And uh, can I say good morning or good afternoon or good evening to our listeners, wherever you are connected from? Um, it's my pleasure to really be um, able to moderate this section. To, um, I can also say uh, joining me on this very panel section are very, very um, experienced, um, what I may call specialists. Um, so it's, it's a great delight. Uh, and also um, to notice that uh, these are specialists that have been in the, in the industry for decades, not just, um, you know, they have very, very good experience in the industry in terms of disruptive engineering, because what Africa need today is a disruptive engineering to really be able to pave way for hydrogen. Um, it, it has been a very, very, um, I'll say long journey for Africa, but uh, it's a time now for Africa to really be able to rise up and take the challenge. And thanks to Matt for really opening the, you know, the, the initial section with so many information to enlighten the people, I mean, Africans on the opportunities, what I may call the low hanging fruits that we can really latch on at this moment while we wait for the export opportunities. Without more ado, uh, join me in welcoming our panelists as I introduce them to these discussions. Uh, let me start by welcoming uh, Dr. Chen Zhu. Uh, maybe, yeah, that's, um, well, I wouldn't want to really say much about um, each of the panelists. They will speak for themselves. Uh, Dr. Chen Zhu, you're welcome to these uh, panel discussions. Maybe you can introduce yourself and then say a little bit about your, 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 your company and also what you do, you know, as um, a specialist.
Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, can, uh, can you hear my, uh, my voice? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So this is Shen Zhu uh, from uh, from Longji Hydrogen. So I'm really happy to uh, to have the uh, chance to to share uh, some 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 my, uh, my my understanding regarding the uh, hydrogen and and uh, uh, and also uh, pre uh, by by honest. Previously, I have um, a, I have more than around ten years R and D research on solar energy, and recently I. I, I joined the hydrogen energy part to uh, from Longi uh, to uh, uh, continue my uh, R and D uh, research. So uh, and you know that uh, Longi is well known as the world uh, world largest solar uh, wafer and panel suppliers. And uh, and based on the, uh, our strategy analysis, we uh, think that the renewable energy plus hydrogen will be uh, becomes very important solutions to achieve zero uh, emission. Uh, so we established the uh, Longji hydrogen in uh, last year, means that uh, uh, 2021. So country we are focused on the alkaline, uh, alkaline water uh, electronic uh, 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 equipment. So uh, our target is uh, become a world uh, lead wa uh, water uh, electrolysis equipment supplier. So um, in less than one year, we already set up around uh, 500 megawatt. Uh, capacity and by end of this year we will achieve around 1.5 gigawatt. So uh, always believe that the uh, the best product comes from the uh, best design. So uh, we are focused on R and D uh, uh, researching and uh, uh, we will uh, bring our best uh, do our best to bring our uh, uh, to bring our customer the best product. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, and um, um, just to reassure our, our listeners again, it's a good opportunity to have these experts joining us today. And I also want to encourage you, if you have any question, feel free to put it on the chat uh, box and uh, we'll be able to, as much as time permit us, handle those, um, those questions as they come in. Uh, and um, I believe it's gonna be a good time for, you know, for us to look at uh, these opportunities in hydrogen, in, I mean, of hydrogen in Africa. Okay, next, I would like to also to introduce the, the next um, panelist that will be joining us today to look at this um, important subject. Um, and that's uh, John George Wagerfield. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. So he will introduce himself and he wants to tell us a little bit about uh, what he do as an individual and what his company also does as well. Thank you and you're welcome, uh, John uh, George. Thank you for the introduction and I'm very happy to participate in this discussion. So my name is Jan Georg Wagenfeld, <laughs> name. Um, I have been working for the technology team in Master Clean Energy and uh, Master Clean Energy is um, a large uh, renewable energy developer, uh, mainly in the past for uh, solar and wind. We are in more than 40 countries and um, uh, are involved in projects with a cross capacity of 14 gigawatt. So um, in the in the past uh, years, we have then been seeing the the transition to green hydrogen and have started to to study the potential. We have one e-fuel project uh, we are currently developing in uh, in Abu Dhabi, where we are planning to demonstrate green hydrogen to e-fuel to sustainable aviation fuel, is in the development. And then we are also involved in large scale green hydrogen projects. Um, globally now. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Jan. Uh, next on the, on, the, on the panelists that will be joining me today to handle this section, I would also like to introduce our next pan panelists. Who, um, and I would like to introduce Matthew Sklinger. I hope I also pronounced the name correctly. Please, Matthew or Materas, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your company and what you also do in the hydrogen space? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Innesen. Um, so my name is Matthias Schlegel, German name, horrible to pronounce, I understand. I, um, I guess you only see, only see my background and not myself, which is a bit sad. I'll um, start with introduction anyways, and then try and get my face on the screen. Um, so yeah, I've spent the last 10 years in, in hydrogen. My background is I'm an engineer um, and um, as you can see, I've, I've started in engineering of hydrogen and then as hydrogen became more and more 
interesting on a global scale project development. I, um, I my focus has shifted to helping investors and project developers getting commercial projects on the ground. So I'm not a researcher. I'm more focused in actually tangible projects going forward. Um, and um, just have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that um, I've worked with two of um, Jan Georg's employers already and we've never uh, met. So my first project was in CSP at Masta, Shams 1. And my second one was with uh, Fresnel Puerto Herado 2. Um, so I, I'm happy that we sit on a panel together and I maybe say something about Fichtner. Fichtner is Germany's largest independent engineering and consulting company. We have 1800 employees worldwide. And we've been doing projects in Africa for around 45 years now, have, have done 500 projects on the continent. And we have a long standing history with hydrogen, about three decades. And um, today I'd love to discuss how we can get the hydrogen experience that we already have on the ground in Africa. Good, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, good to hear that you've actually been involved in the hydrogen in Africa. I think that would be, we would like to really share from your experience as well. Okay, let me now start with uh, Matthias, if you don't mind, um, because you're looking at the African sector, for instance, when we look at the, the technology environment, one thing that is a, a major driver is, um, you know, standards. Um, I, I've seen, being in the industry for decades now, standard is what controls what we design and how we design things. Uh, Matthias, if you don't mind then, can you share with us how has it really been in terms of standard when it comes to hydrogen or let's say the, the green space generally. I have personally struggled to actually pin down a standard in terms of what I would call a global harmonized standard that is being worked to. So you see each company is working their own, uh, what I would call in their own silos on the standard. Some clients work in their own silos on the standard, but a unified global standard is something that I actually struggle to find. How really have your company cope with that kind of um, being able to juggle your client standard, your own standard, when there's no re, you know, global standard actually drives the whole system. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not only hydrogen specific. That's if you work for a lot of clients and a lot of countries, it's, it's always an issue. I've personally worked in the aerospace industry, in the, in the power plant industry, in renewables. You are absolutely right in pointing out there's always something to adapt on, to adapt to. The, the good thing is, um, physics and technology is, uh, will stay physics and technology regardless of the country, regardless of the, of the, of the client you have. So that's, um, as an engineer, you always have to learn. And I think for us, it's always interesting to, to be in other countries and to learn about the standards that they have. And it's not just internationally. If you look at, for example, I've, I think, last October we visited a, a hydrogen fueling station in Italy and it's probably three times as big as it would be in Germany simply because the standards are different because you have to have huge safety distances you have walls in between the, the thing looked like a military installation and here just in my hometown there's one um, just right on the airport looks like a normal gas station so you're right there's there's things to learn um, luckily on the production side Hydrogen is something that has been around in um, quite a bit, as, as you're fully aware, coming from the oil and gas industry. So I think there's, on the production side, there's quite a bit of established standards, technically. Um, everything consumer related, I think we have a way to go there. All right, thank you very much. I wanted to know if I'm the only one struggling, and I know some of the guys <laughs> connected online will also be struggling in the era of standardization of, um, you know, um, uh, equipment for the hydrogen space. Okay, let me now move then to Chen, Dr. Chen Zhu, if you don't mind. Can you share with us, how has it been on the Asia side, let's say in China or in, in within the Asia regions where you normally deploy equipment? Um, can you share your experience, how has standardization been in terms of the green technology space? Or let me just basically go to the hydrogen space, uh, manufacturing these equipment, how has it actually, have you, have you been able to juggle between this standard and aligning in the equipment designs? Yeah, so uh, uh, in fact, according to my understanding, in, in fact, in China, even in Asia, so um, 
So we, uh, the hydrogen energy also is uh, in the uh, early stage. So the standard is also under developing. So um, it's not only, be, uh, only based on the equipment itself, it's also based on the, the greed, you know, the safety and uh, the environment, the different kinds of different countries and also have the different uh, specifications uh, for, uh, for, for both of the, all the uh, greed equipment, uh, uh, the uh, safety, all the things. So, and uh, we, from country to country, so you found that this totally, some, sometimes you will find this totally different. So we are also collecting all the kinds of the uh, center internally and to, to check, uh, is there any uh, chance to, to combine some together or to find the common things and to, to, to try to, uh, to, 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 uh, to meet uh, most of the uh, dif uh, different uh, requests from our different customers from different countries, different areas. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, it's aligning that um, the issue of standard is a global issue, not really a, a localized issue. Um, then if you don't mind, uh, Jan, Jan George, let, let me come to you then. What will, what will be your advice to Africans, for instance, some technological companies in Africa who are thinking, okay, I want to get involved in this technological space, but they are a bit scared. That, oh, I don't have a standard to guide me. I don't know how do I juggle between all of these. What would be your advice to such a companies? Maybe they are connected now. Mm. I mean, again, as Matthias mentioned, it really depends on um, do you go to the production side or uh, the consumption side with um, uh, refueling stations, for example. I mean, usually if you have already a chemical industry, um, I would rely on the know-how and you're, you're probably following ASME standards or European standards um, for, let's say, the balance of plant and all the piping. So this already gives some guidance what you could follow. Um, and then in the end, um, there will be a period where uh, the, the developers and the OEM providers have to trail praise a little bit uh, sensible standards. Um, I think the, uh, we are struggling exactly with the, the example Matthias brought up that uh, how big is the safety distance for, for example, refueling stations. Um, you have to make it sensible. And I think there will be definitely a period where uh, it's up to um, all the parties involved in this um, in the space to come up with sensible um, standards, lending from, let's say, I already know how from the, the chemical industry, the oil and gas industry, but again, finding a, um, a workable solution. Um, and this will be an iterative process with um, yeah, all the parties involved. Thank you very much, uh, Jan George. Um, let me now go to the next aspect of a very, very challenging aspect of the technology, which is cost. At the moment, I know it's a global issue, but um, because the main driver of the cost, I remember listening to one of the speakers yesterday who mentioned 80% of the cost of um, hydrogen production, actually in terms of the capex comes from the technology, you know, aspect of the, of the, of the production. So what that means is that the main driver of the cost is the technology. But if you don't mind again, coming to you, Matthias, um, having experienced a little bit about the African side of things, um, of course, Africa is unique in a way because every maybe so component of the of the of the of the technology itself is going to be imported so that even add to the cost apart from the fact that it's already expensive from the main manufacturing side so let me now listen to you on this um how do you think we could be able to really manage this aspect for instance without having more cost impact um, it's a challenging question i know because we are trying to now reduce cost cost is already high on its own but how really do you think, or let me just put it in a much more simpler way, for instance, um, a technology developed locally, of course, will remove that cost. But again, we're not yet there. So would it be okay, do we focus on technology at this moment that will look at the localized aspect where we remove a little bit of the, of the, of the import aspect? Of course, that can be you know, an aspect that uh, any, of the, um, any of the companies listening to us now want to really get involved in. It's okay, let's focus on the local side where we don't need to import some of these equipments, of course, some will be imported, but not all the equipment. So what would be your advice then in terms of how, how do you see the, 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 the options of really removing the impact of costs with importing of this equipment, considering that um, technology already is having a huge impact in terms of the cost? Let me just uh, hear your view on that, please. You're muted, please, Matthias. Sorry, thank you. I think there's two aspects to this. The one is 
if you look at the overall costs of hydrogen, how are they composed? Part is, as you said exactly, the electrolysis capex, and the other is energy. And um, it depends on the setting uh, you're in. If you have, for example, um, like in, in many regions in Africa, a great combination of wind and solar that gives you many full load hours throughout the year, or you have hydropower, or you have geothermal. I think Africa has many parts of the continent with renewable energy sources that are very well suited for hydrogen production. Why? Because um, with every full load hour that you have, your the impact of capital costs goes down and down, right? If you just have solar, you you get to um, a usage rate of your plant of maybe 30, 35%. But if you have a good combination of solar and wind, you get to a higher usage rate with hydro, ge geothermal, even higher and higher. And this means your fixed cost distributes over higher production part. And this means your the actual share of the, the components, the new technology that you're talking about goes down and down and down for every kilogram. So I think Africa actually has a competitive advantage there just because of the, the type of natural resources that are there. And the other thing is what's important to remember when people talk about electrolysis, they always talk about the cost of the electrolysis package itself. But what's not to be forgotten is it's an, it's, it's an entire plant. You, you coming from the oil and gas industry, again, you know it, right? There's piping and valves involved. There's pressure tanks involved. There's, there's a lot of civil involved as well, which is not to be forgotten. And that's not even speaking about everything that you need to construct to actually get us a, a useful infrastructure. I mean, if we're talking about going to hydrogen, if we are talking about actually reaching at zero, this means we are going to change our entire world. This is not just the production plant. And there's a lot of local value added that's possible there. So I I think, uh, yes, there's parts that, that are to be imported, but I think you, you can actually generate um, quite a bit of local value added um, in the entire value chain, going from the electrolysis up onto a harbor. Thank you very much, Matthias. I think you just mentioned something that struck my mind now, and that is the fact that um, the cost is not just based on the tech. I mean, on the on the equipment alone, but also on the you know the the power or the energy you know to power the whole system. Of which Africa has an advantage here in terms of the sun, the wind, you know, and also the hydro in some certain locations. That's good. So, Jan uh, Jung, let, let 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 me look at it from another perspective again with you then. Um, you know, I know one area that um, I know a lot of Africans worry about is what we call the energy balance in terms of, um, you know, they tell you we're struggling right now with power. Um, and then we're not talking of taking from that same power to now go and power the electrolytic system for, you know, for hydrogen. But again, I think sometimes they forget that hydrogen is only a carrier. You know, you're not actually, you're like preserving that power in a way. So it could be used like, for instance, for a backup system for you know, or for the power, which means you are preserving your power to reuse it later, not like you're actually throwing it away. So what then will you kind of, let's look at your view in that area. How really can we maintain a kind of an energy balance in a way, you know, not really, you know, using the energy to the extent that even the common, you know, African will no longer have an energy. Of course, that's not possible in a way. So what do you, what's, your, what's your thought in terms of um, how do we maintain that balance in a way that, we are still maintaining the, the energy that's needed locally. And at the same time, we're also having some reserves to be able to help the, you know, the, the production of green hydrogen or other, other alternative um, derivatives that will be helpful in, in boosting the economy. But at the same time, we're not uh, starving the, the local use of mm -hmm. the energy. Let me hear your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, I, I mean, for us, definitely, if we are talking about green hydrogen projects, it's usually a combination of the energy production and the hydrogen production. So this is a, a very good point you're raising. We don't want to take crit electricity away uh, from somebody uh, because they would need to replace it then perhaps with gas power or diesel generators. Uh, and this would defy a little bit the pur uh, purpose of producing um, green hydrogen. Um, so we would always aim to build additional uh, um, power infrastructure, uh, wind power plants and uh, PV power plants, which actually then could in the same time support the grid 
especially when you go to very high um, renewable energy uh, penetrations in the grid. Uh, an electrolyzer can become uh, act in the future in a stabilizing way. On the one hand, reducing a little bit the load when there's uh, less wind and solar, or maybe, as you mentioned, uh, in future scenarios, even uh, using the, the hydrogen again uh, to, uh, to support the grid. I mean, immediately we probably see more um, uh, green hydrogen going into the chemical industry um, or being exported, but there definitely there are interesting scenarios where then you use a bit of this hydrogen to stabilize the grid, especially when you're struggling um, in, in certain parts of the grid with um, uh, blackouts or something similar. Thank you very much, Jan George. I think you've really mentioned it rightly. Um, it's not uh, taken away, it's even added because in a way, for instance, if we, um, let's say companies coming in to integrate um, any of the green hydrogen or green energy, I mean, green hydrogen derivatives, uh, you know, factory or industrial production uh, site in there, of course, they're coming to generate. They're not gonna just come and hang on the, on the grid. They're gonna have their own generation you know, plant or a means of generating. Of course, they may also take from the grid, but whatever they're taking from the grid can be a preservative where that can be fed back at the later part of the day when, those grids are heavily used. For instance, in some of the grids, during the night when people are sleeping, it's less used and those energy have been wasted. So if we use the option of, let's say, hydrogen to store this um, excess, what I'm call excess um, you know, power, and in the daytime when it's super used, all these are fed back again to the grid, I think that would be a very good option where we can maintain that grid on a unified um, you know, usage um, approach where we, you know, in the night we can balance it up with whatever we have by storing in, in, the, in, in the night and then reusing in the day. That will really be you know, a helpful alternative as well. Uh, let me now come to you, um, Jensu. Um, I mean, Dr. Jensu. Uh, let's look at the area again, another very, very important area to, uh, to the African storage. Um, I know even in Europe now, storage is still a challenge because um, people believe hydrogen is very volatile. Uh, you, can, you have limitations as to where you can store it. But I know ammonia is an alternative um, in terms of storage. But again, when you crack it back again to hydrogen, a lot of loss and other things. So uh, let me now look at uh, the aspect of storage. I know it's see a very, very um, challenging area at the moment. No standardized storage system has been developed. How has it been in the Asia region? I've been reading on the news how Asia have actually developed several storage systems that have been helpful. Of course, they need to be standardized and all taken through the systems. So let's hear your view. How has it been with the area of storage technology in the Asia region? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So um, for the uh, hydrogen uh, storage, uh, it, it's uh, honestly, it's really, currently it's really uh, not so easy to do it because the cost is really high. Uh, uh, currently, so according to our un internally uh, understanding, and also some, uh, we are also doing some study to uh, to uh, research on how to utilize the hydrogen after we <laughs> generate it. So uh, by now, we we still think that just make it into uh, tran uh, transfer to ammonia, and then and then uh, do the transport and all the storage, and then. Uh, uh, change back to hydrogen and to use it is the best solution until now, yeah. Thank you very much. I think that view is quite clear. So if I would to add to that view, then if we can store for export, then as Africans, why don't we consider a technology that will be able to you know, do produce locally, use locally, then you remove storage from the, from the supply chain for now, depending when, you know, the technology for storage comes into place. So if you're an African, they're listening to us now, Consider what can you what can you develop locally? Use it locally. You remove storage for now, depending when we're able to get uh, a more standardized storage systems. Um, having said that, let's now go into the area of um, you know the, the 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 transportation side of things. But before then, for those who are listening, please if you have any question, feel free to post it on the on the chat section so that we can look at those questions. But uh, let me just come to this question. There is one question here. And it says, uh, maybe I will direct this to any of any of the panelists can just answer it if you have the answer there. How do we move to get the technology appreciated in Africa to allow the development of the market that attracts the necessary funding to get hydrogen project off the ground? Uh, just to put it in a summarized way, it's like in Africa, if how do you really develop a technology that, it, that can be recognized and you're able to have an off-taker to buy in into that your technology? 
Uh, maybe let's start from maybe Matthias, you can just come in there. I know you've been in Africa, so would you have a view on that, you know, for an African technology just developed, how will they get an off taker that will buy into that technology? I think what's important is to make it economically attractive for the off taker. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I recently read a quote from the CEO of Bank of America in the Wall Street Journal talking about decarbonization, and he said, if there is a revenue stream, the funding is infinite. Um, and I think that explains the point, right? Um, it's, it's, it's the same as when natural gas got into European market. It's, it's decades ago, but the same story. The thought was always, how do you get that new energy source cost competitive for the end user? What do you need to do? And um, that's, that's the, the incentive scheme. So I think you already gave the answer. You have to think it from from the end consumer, how do I make it attractive for the end consumer to use the product I want to push on the market? And interestingly, in, in Europe and in, in Germany, we always keep the impression that we've thought this through and so on and so forth. But up until, let's say, maybe one or two years ago, when I sat on, on panels with, with, with politicians in Germany, it was always thinking from the production side. We always, basically, hydrogen was the waste of the energy sector that got dumped into the natural gas grid until they found and everyone thought well that's not attractive um we're not making any money of it and the projects didn't come and now we're, we're starting to look at well um as you exactly pointed out um what could be what could make it attractive for an off taker and all of a sudden you create this pull effect um, of the entire value chain forming up because suddenly there's there's the ver the, the revenue stream i quoted Thank you very much, Matthias. I think you've rightly mentioned it. I mean, you know, as an off-taker, if I'm an off-taker, for instance, if you develop a technology that actually attracts my attention, I'm going to put my money on it anyway. And that's what, you know, off-takers are investors. They have the money. They're only yeah. looking for the technology. Uh, yeah. So I think for those listening, uh, if you have any idea, any innovations, just go ahead. I mean, develop your concept. Put it out. Because um, if your technology attracts investors, they will put their money into that very technology, definitely, for sure. So yours is to make sure uh, you don't consider yourself as the end user, consider the end users. What would they want? What would they like to see? Um, look at Africa as a concept, for instance. You don't think of Europe for now. Think of Africa. What would be, what would be useful to an African when it comes to this green technology? If you go for that, I can tell you, you will get an off-taker who will buy into that technology instantly. Of course, in Africa, we know subsidy is not um, very much available. Uh, and then you have to think of a commercial, uh, in terms of commercially and economically feasible uh, innovation. So if you develop an innovation that is not economically or commercially feasible, of course, that would deter the investors. So that's very important um, you know, to note. Uh, that will not take me to the next um, aspect in terms of transportation. Uh, maybe I'll throw this question to you, um, Jan George. Um, recently, I saw um, a kind of um, one of the innovators in Africa, they sent um, an approach to us, for instance, asking, they're developing a, a car technology that uses hydrogen. But I was like, if this person could have been very much thoughtful, I think the market which are focused on at the moment is, you know, an area that will be more, at, you know, for this, uh, let's put it this way, there are some loss risks when it comes to Africa, for instance, yeah? So you can be developing hydrogen now for, for instance, um, a loss risk car use. You know, I mean, as an investor, that would that wouldn't catch the attention of the investors. But for instance, if you develop it for a high, I mean, haulage use, you know, those heavy trucks that we know the electric part cannot fulfill that that demand, which means there's a void in terms of demand. Uh, let me now put it to you: how how is it going? For instance, what can you share with us from what Jenny have done in terms of the technology for the transportation sector? For instance, the high heavy duty you know trucks those um, shipping industries that are what are called heavy users, that even the electric aspect cannot fulfill that demand, but the demand is already there, that maybe an African listening now is okay, I can think of that, you know. But for, let's say, a small car, luxury cars, I can tell you it's not, it won't be, it won't be lucrative to anybody who really want to invest. Let me, let me hear your view how it has been in Germany for high, I mean, uh, haulage, um, you know, vehicles or heavy usage, um, in terms of a shipping industry and all those high well, users. Let, let's hear a view on that, please. 
so I, I have to speak for United Arab Emirates in this <laughs> regard. Um, so um, we we are developing in Abu Dhabi um, a sustainable aviation fuel project. So um, it is kind of a derivative from hydrogen for the uh, the mobility sector for airplanes. And I think this is one of the let's say easier uh, um, um, examples where hydrogen, at least for long haul flights, will be very difficult to realize. I mean, especially when you consider 40 year lifetimes for for airplanes. So. Uh, having for example an e-fuel uh, project with hydrogen uh, could be an interesting avenue then you brought up also for the shipping sector i mean uh, there will be also probably applications for derivatives again i mean uh, people are looking into um, uh, synthetic methanol or ammonia and um, then as you rightfully said um, for uh, heavy uh, heavy trucks there uh, probably direct use of hydrogen could be interesting uh, we, we are planning to, to test some uh, hydrogen buses uh, in our demonstrator plant in Master City. And um, we don't have uh, a big mining industry, but there it could be quite interesting, probably, uh, especially in, in, in Africa, where this is a big industry, to, uh, um, to look into producing hydrogen for uh, these mines, for example. Um, as you mentioned rightfully, for the personal, uh, for the small cars, um, it probably uh, it has to be seen, but at the moment uh, there is a very strong competition with electric uh, batteries, and uh, it's not necessary uh, to go to hydrogen there. Thank you very much, John. John, and apology, I thought you were in Germany, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I think you you rightly mentioned it, which is correct. I mean, if you know, and I remember the uh, last speaker mentioned something. You want to look for an area where hydrogen will be competitive, because you know when you talk of small cars. Hydrogen can never be competitive because electric is more competitive in there. When you talk of high haulage vehicles, for instance, of course, hydrogen is more competitive. So for investors that are listening now, think of areas where hydrogen is competitive in Africa. And then you'll be able to have a leverage that can really attract investors to, you know, to be able to invest into your technology. Now, let me now move to um, Genzu, Dr. Genzu. Um, let's look at another very useful area in terms of the local application. Now, um, I remember the last, um, you know, uh, speaker, he mentioned an area that really would be very, very helpful in, you know, in looking at this. He said, look, the fertilizer industry area, the urea, uh, which are locally used, an uh, area that may be of consideration when it comes to hydrogen investment, okay? Now, in Africa, for instance, um, I was involved in some couple of um, discussions recently where they are looking at fertilizer. At the moment, an average, uh, you know, Africans who are you know, majorly farmers, I mean, you know, and they are struggling in terms of fertilizers. At the moment, they have to import the fertilizers. These fertilizers will not come in country on time. And when they eventually comes in, um, you know, it's very expensive because of, you know, duties and all, all the, you know, currency, um, you know, uh, conversion and everything that's actually accumulates in it. So at the end of the day, they are paying a heavy amount on those fertilizers than they could have paid, you know, ideally as farmers. Now, for let's say, you know, a, a company out there today that's listening and say, oh, why can't I consider hydrogen for manufacturing of urea, which is a byproduct of, uh, I mean, a derivative, or considering hydrogen for manufacturing of uh, fertilizers, which can be used locally, which means you remove the supply chain of, you know, technology that has to be imported. And also, you're able to reach the farmers on time, you meet their, 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 need, their demand on time. And I, I tell you, the farmers will be very happy about that to pay whatever the amount that is needed. Now, maybe you can share your experience in this area. How really will an African, for instance, be thinking now in terms of the technology for those derivatives? Um, what's your experience in terms of the Asia regions? Has there been anything in this regard where people are looking at the derivatives? How can they can really apply hydrogen to the derivatives in terms of the technology? I don't know if my question is clear enough. So we're looking at the application now in terms of local use for fertilizers, for urea or other, items that are used locally. So what would be your advice to an average African that is listening that really want to look for a technology to, that, will, that will really meet that local demand for fertilizers and for locally used derivatives? Okay, so um, uh, according to my understanding, in fact, if you, uh, in Africa, so uh, is there always some uh, uh, good uh, scenarios can be uh, used uh, to uh, with hydrogen is that so? Uh, 
um, you we can consider about is to, to combine the like the renewable energy such as PV solar solar energy plant together with the with the with the hydrogen uh, generator together, and then it's 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 it will be the good choice. So currently we are also because as you know that Longi we already have uh, well done on the on the on the on the PV part. So we are also developing the solutions to combine these two together. And uh, currently uh, in, in in China mainland we already uh, uh, cooperate with one uh, one important customer to uh, do this kind of things to combine the solar and also the the the, the hygiene, uh, uh generator together. And this can I believe that this kind of solution also can help re really helpful in Africa. Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, view. Um, maybe Matthias, do you want to throw in your, your view on that as well? I know you've been in Africa. Um, the hanging fruits now is what we're looking at. How really, what would be your advice to companies that are listening right now and they're saying, oh, we want to consider technology for the local applications, what we call the hanging fruits. What would be your advice to them? I think the lessons learned from, from the projects that, we, that we've had so far are, are quite clear. It's um, you start, again at, at the total cost for the consumer and you think well where can we find an edge if we want to do something new um i give you an example of a project that we've had in germany that might also apply to the african context so first a bit of um, physical and technical background hydrogen as many of you know probably has a very low volumetric energy density because it has a low density so if you transport hydrogen in gaseous form you can only transport very little energy. As an example, if you look at the largest hydrogen trucks out there, the 18 meter tube trailers, they, trans uh, they transport all, only half the amount of energy of a conventional oil truck. And um, that means hydrogen gets quite expensive. And we've had projects that we are currently working on. One is actually going into operation later this year, um, where, the, the operator and the owner, the company is making use of that fact. Um, one of the project is located in a part of Germany where there's not much industry around. So then there's hydrogen off takers already that need it for the industrial processes and so on. And they would have to pay for gray hydrogen to be trucked in, which gets very expensive. And in the end is cheaper to produce green on site. Imagine that. And people are always talking about subsidies, but in the end, this works by just thinking of a clever niche. You know, it's transport, uh, it's production, transport, and use. And that gives you the cost of hydrogen. Or another example, um, I'm, um, if I'm not mistaken, is that ammonia and fertilizers are often imported in, in, in many African countries. And what you can do is if you, you have available natural resources in terms of renewable energies, you can create them, you can produce ammonia, you can produce the finished product yourselves in the country, and then you can see, well, is that cost competitive to world market or is it not? And um, with all of a sudden, with the, with the, the spike in natural gas prices, um, green against gray ammonia or fertilizers may become cost competitive in in, in, in with local production and increasing your local value added that we talked about in an earlier question. So I think it's, it's always having the entire value chain in your mind. That's always when clients come to us developing a project, it's, it's always we, we look at the entire value chain and then we see um, where can you be, where can you intelligently, intelligently pick your spot with your consumers to actually create value for both parties. Thank you very much, Matthias. I think you've really made a very good point there. You know, um, recently we had the opportunity of working with um, a team of experts looking at the cost analysis in terms of um, fertilizer importation compared to locally produced fertilizers. And I can tell you it shows very positive. In short, there's a project now ongoing in, in Kenya that's already looking at this to establish a fertilizer plant where fertilizer is going to be manufactured locally. But the driver is that... Um, they have the, you know, the energy production or the, from the grid, which is at a very, very relatively moderate price because most of the, you know, so again, energy is, is the driver there. So if you are located in an environment where the, the cost um, per, per, per kilowatt of the energy cost is low, 
definitely it can be an opportunity for you. So if you're a listener out there, you know, look at, okay, what's the cost in terms of, uh, you know, energy unit uh, per kilowatt? And then you can do some calculations, you know, and at the end of the day, it may be most cost competitive to manufacture locally because you have the local resources, everything in there that even as, you know, importing these fertilizers into those regions. So thank you very much for that uh, insight. Then let me now go to the last, I um, mean, the, the last aspect because we're running out of time at the moment. Um, but before then, let me see if I can take one question from the audience. But for those listening in the audience, please put in your questions um, and uh, our panelists will be more than happy to look at your questions. Uh, one of the questions here says, what, uh, what is the framework for using hydrogen to boost utility efficiency, um, especially in Nigeria? Maybe, um, Jane George, you can be able to answer this. I mean, how can we use hydrogen to boost our utilities in terms of, uh, um, you know, grid supplies? Uh, I mean, we've already spoken about a little bit about that already, where they can store in the in the in the, in the night when it's low when it's low usage and repackage. But let me hear your view on that then, Jen. I mean, I can't speak for Nigeria, but um, what we are currently, for example, I mentioned is also demand response. So we are we will be building. Um, uh, renewable energy uh, plants which supply electricity which we most of the time would consume ourselves but uh, it could be an interesting scenario where you're actually working together with utilities and tell them look you have the direct wire to us and if you uh, have problems uh, with um, electricity supply we uh, shut down our production and uh, feed into the grid so uh, there will be not only in terms of storage, but also just as a demand response, uh, being a big uh, consumer of electricity, which can actually ramp down really fast. There could be some interesting scenarios. I mean, this this is still uh, uh, there is still no working concept or um, none I know about, but there will be definitely some potential synergies when you integrate these really large consumers uh, into a national grid. Absolutely, you're very correct in that. Uh, but for those um, you know, listening, it's it's a very simple logic in that, uh, and it's very very just find out from the grid or whoever the utility you know managers of your of your, of your country in Africa, and, and then look at how to really work you know relatively with them. All you need to do is if you can be able to produce, they are producing the night anyway when people are sleeping. If they're able to start there with you know hydrogen or any of the options, and then feedback to the system that can help boost and stabilize, you know, those power. And for countries as well that are having, you know, challenges in terms of epileptic powers, you know, in the day and in the night, that can also be an option to boost um, such power. So hydrogen, it's, it's, um, it, it's an option for boosting the utilities in terms of storage and refitting back again. And even in the tel telecom as well, if you have your systems where the telecoms, uh, for instance, need uh, a continuous power usage, of course, hydrogen can be, able to be used to boost uh, such uh, power as well. Now, let me now look at the application aspects. Um, recently, I've seen a lot of, um, I mean, I've been opportunity to read a lot of uh, publications on different innovations coming up, you know, for hydrogen. Um, and sometimes it could be a bit daunting to be precise, you know, sometimes I, I pick this and the next one, another one come again. So you're like, which one do I go for here? Um, for Africa, of course, there has not been really much, which makes it a very good playground for any African listening now who will really want to think of investing into technology in Africa. Um, let me start, uh, maybe uh, Chen, Chen Zhu, Dr. Chen Zhu. Uh, what do you think in terms of um, um, the, the technology side, um, what will you think? Let, let's look at the solar part, for instance, and we can try to narrow it down to the hydrogen part. Um, the rate at which the technology is evolving, um, how do you think we can, I mean, what's your advice in terms of um, standardizing, you know, because if you pick a technology today and the next day you pick the next one, you pick the next one, you will never come to a point. So how do we then come to a point where we can say we need to standardize here? So what's your experience with your company in terms of your product? You pick a product, you develop it, you standardize it. So let's just hear from you, you know, share your experience on that, please. So um, uh, you mean that the, the such as the uh, technology, uh, how to cho choose uh, the the competitive, the, the standard product, or the how to uh, choose the suitable uh, technology to uh, to 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 which is um, more uh, suitable for the uh, for the for the such as Africa Celoria. So um, a based on my 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 understanding, so in, you know that so currently we think that is the large uh, product, uh, pr productivity 
uh, ability for the uh, for the equipment is really important. And uh, also, uh, if you if you can combine combine the uh, your equipment together with some uh, green energy uh, uh, systems, will be more perfect. So so that's why. So we are uh, firstly we focus on the uh, uh, solar, and then now we expand to the uh, energy part, and we choose the airline uh, technology, which is uh, which is have the uh, competitive cost and the very large hydrogen uh, productivity technology. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good view as well. You know, on that standardization can be a bit um, a challenge, especially when uh, you know it's still evolving. But um, I believe at some point it will be you know an area where each of the organizations or you know the different regions we start to align and standardize in terms of the product. Of course, when we know what happened in the oil and gas, it was the same thing with so many technology back and forward, but at some point, each of the organizations started standardizing, which is a good thing. Uh, let me now move to you now, Matthias. Uh, Matthias. Um, le let, me, let me pose this question to you. There's one question online here, and it says, um, are there any plans to use green hydrogen in refineries? Um, do you, you know, what's your experience with refineries or maybe manufacturing plants or what I may call the process plants that have been using um, you know, green hydrogen. You're muted, Matthias. I'm learning. <laughs> no, <this laughs> no problem myself. Myself. <laughs> We're in the same boat. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's that's a great place to start. And we heard we heard earlier in, in the presentation, hydrogen is um, is at its most valuable when it's more than it's just is its calorific value. And we shouldn't forget that we are producing a lot of hydrogen today already. We are producing around 70 million tons per year. And that is a market of around $100 billion a year. So we use a lot of hydrogen uh, and produce it. And that comes with a quite a carbon footprint that is more or less the same size as the entire carbon footprint of Germany. So I think that's that's a good place to start because um, it's it's a natural well starting point and the prices are usually higher than if you just burn the thing. And um, so from our side, um, we have quite a few projects in, in refineries going on for exactly the same reason, that they need to decarbonize first the hydrogen they already use before all, uh, going to the even more exciting projects that Jan Georg is mentioning, where you make the entire fuel carbon neutral, not just the hydrogen you use in the refinery. For example, there is a 10 megawatt PEM electrolysis in, in the Heide refinery in Germany. It's currently the largest operational PEM electrolysis in the world, um, which it won't be for long, I'm very sure. But the, I think the chemical industry, you can read, chemical and, and uh, oil and gas industry, you can uh, read announcements almost every day now, um, Yara, the fertilizer company, um, Covestro with, um, in Germany, um, signing a MOU with Fortescue Future Industries. That's just in the last week. And so there's, there's a lot going on and it's a good starting point. And therefore I, I like the question. I totally agree that, that um, there's, there's a lot going on in the sector. Yeah, we're, we're running out of time, but um, I will just try to see if we can answer this last question and then we can uh, wrap up. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, maybe I will ask uh, Janjur to please uh, provide that. Are there any organization funded research? Of course, I, I know um, we, can, we can't really channel it to Africa because Africa doesn't have any subsidy, unfortunately, but yeah, there are global you no know, funding. But let me hear your view, uh, Janjur, please. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of research going on um, and um, I mean, uh, I'm not uh, super aware of uh, which uh, companies or uh, which governmental entities uh, provide funding there, but I think it, it is very crucial. There will be a lot of domains where progress is needed. It's not only the electrolyzer. Uh, which is the most uh, prominent part of it, but it will be going into handling hydrogen storage is a really big topic. Then all the, the downstream infrastructure, the, the consumers. So there, there will be a lot of opportunity to, to advance um, this whole space. And um, we, we just hope that uh, the more the industry is scaling up, the more funding will be also available uh, to get a little bit more into the detail of specific applications. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, but the, whoever has asked that question, in terms of funding, there are a lot of funds available. 
but again, not specific. I mean, some are actually kind of channeled to Africa, depending on the area of research you want to go into. Uh, but you could uh, check um, and uh, be able to, uh, if you also have any challenge, you know, you can get across to any of our panelists, we'll be able to support you in that. But however, there are research funding, depending on what you want to cover in your research and also how important or how valuable will it be to the development of, um, you know, the, the, the value chain aspect you want to focus on. So it's something that um, you need to look into. Uh, finally, before we, we drop off, I want to just uh, take, um, you know, your last um, remark from each of the presenters. Maybe I'll start from you, uh, Chenzu. What's your remark to an African thinking of technology for maybe solar or the green energy or the hydrogen energy space? So, so uh, again, so I I think so. So uh, because you know the, the uh, renewable uh, energy resources in Africa is really abundant. So I believe that the green uh, renewable energy, such as solar, plus the green hydrogen, was the best choice for Africa. Thank you for that uh, remark. That's good, uh, Matthias. Let's hear, let's hear from you your remark to an average and uh, you know, African thinking of technology for the green space. <laughs> That's a broad question. <laughs> um, I think um, we as humanity have set ourselves to goal to change our entire world in the next two and a half decades. And that's, that's opportunity for everyone. Um, you still need to be clever. Not everything will make you money, but um, there's a lot of opportunity out there in the next two and a half decades to come. Thank you very much, Matthias. And uh, Jan George, what's your remark for our listeners? Yeah, I, I would also go in this direction. Again, um, the, the landscape will uh, change completely. Like the, the, the standards uh, or the traditional uh, energy providers uh, will eventually run out or stop uh, delivering oil and gas. And there will be new players uh, uh, coming into the game. And now it really depends on uh, the, the availability of good renewable resources with a high capacity factor, wind, solar, um, um, hy uh, hydropower. So, um, and eventually, um, let's say the technical uh, details will be uh, leveled out in the, in the next years. And then it really comes down to, um, do you have good resources? And I think Africa is a, in a really good um, uh, position there and also could be a really uh, big large consumer uh, for these locally produced um, hydrogen uh, products and derivatives. Thank you very much. Um, I think to wrap it up, um, as our panelists have actually summed it up already. The resources is there, but however, the technology is a thousand miles. Let me use that word to quantify it. But a thousand miles start with just one step. So take the step. Think of what can you do for Africa in terms of technology. Don't be, don't be afraid to fail. You could fail, that's fine. Fail and then try again. So for listeners out there who are thinking of technology for Africa, the opportunities is great for you. But you need to take a step at a time, seek for you know, guidance and just um, the opportunity is great. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And I uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Innocent, and thanks to uh, your panelists uh, for this lively discussion. Um, personal takeaway in the same line as uh, several things that were mentioned yesterday already is that uh, uh, there could be a lot of opportunities for, for local production, local use. I mean, we mentioned the ammonia, we mentioned the fertilizer, um, and I know there are several, uh, um, several African entrepreneurs listening today, judging by the conversations on the chat and, and uh, the questions that have been submitted. Um, so yes, it's, it seems that there is a, an interesting business opportunity there, uh, definitely worth investigating further. So if that's okay with you, Alexander, um, maybe we can move on directly to, to your presentation. So briefly, Alexander, uh, before I head over the the speech to you. So you're based in Bonn. Uh, you work with Get Invest as head of mobilization. Um, and mobilization really means like mobilization uh, of investments for renewable energy projects. 
We've been doing this uh, for quite a while now, uh, for about 10 years. So um, this is really your topic of expertise. Um, you've worked many years also with, uh, with GIZ, but now since 2021, you are coordinating the, um, specifically the, the hydrogen window on Brigade Invest. And so um, today I understand you're here to um, tell us a little bit more about these different projects promoted by, uh, by Get Invest with regards to, to hydrogen and green hydrogen in Africa. So Alexander, thank you so much for joining us and I will just uh, hand over to you uh, and welcome your presentation. Thank you so much, John, and uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, it's definitely my pleasure to be here today. I hope you can all hear me well and the microphone is okay. Yes. Perfect. Um, I think John uh, has, has been a bit ambitious in, in my introduction when, when he wrote that uh, I would introduce European programs because, you know, th there are quite a few on hydrogen, as you can imagine. So um, I will actually focus a bit on Get Invest and how Get Invest can, um, can support uh, you with your hydrogen program if you're a developer, um, but also to give a bit uh, of our peers and, and colleagues here an idea of, of what the program has to offer and um, where, where we uh, can support in, in the current state of the market. So with, without much further ado, um, Get Invest is, uh, is a European program so we are funded by the European Union uh, and several member states. You can see them here at the bottom. It's Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands and Austria. And our core mandate is really mobilizing investments in renewable energy. Now, this is where we come from traditionally. We've been operating this program now, uh, if we count also the predecessor program since uh, early 2016. And have built a nice infrastructure for supporting private sector actors in renewable energy and accessing finance. Um, when I say renewable energy, what do I specifically mean? Well, these days uh, we are working really on all the relevant delivery models, all the way from off-grid solar um, to, let's say, grid-connected uh, um, renewable energy projects. We also work lately in uh, clean cooking, we work in energy efficiency, we work uh, also in storage, e-mobility, and since last year we are also, uh, we've opened our services for uh, hydrogen projects, green hydrogen projects um, in our partner countries. Um, we work very, very much with partners, um, especially with industry associations, so it's also my uh, distinct pleasure to, to work here today uh, jointly with, with the African Solar Industry Association and uh, hope to do a lot more work uh, with John in the future because I think uh, today's event has once more shown that Afsia is a very strong sector and we're to be a part of it. Um, we are primarily active in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we also work in the Caribbean and Pacific, but that's a smaller uh, segment of our work. Uh, the, really, the bulk of our, our work is, uh, is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we are, as a program, uh, implemented by GIZ. You know, I'm a GIZ employer, the uh, employee, the um, German Development Corporation Agency. And as a program, we are hosted on the multi-donor platform GetPro, just a bit as background. Um, what do we offer? And I will delve a bit more into detail uh, here in a minute, but just to give you a quick overview. At, at the heart of the program is really finance access advisory. This is where uh, private companies are being directly supported in you know, uh, finding the right financier, getting ready for finance, uh, um, you know, enhancing their bankability, as one says, and, and then also um, supporting them in their transaction with uh, financiers. Um, we also have lately a new component, which we call Finance Systems Advisory, where we work with directly with local uh, financiers, local banks, in order to um, enhance their capacity to do renewable energy investments and really also enhance their footprint uh, in, in the sector. Um, we do a lot of mobilization work, primarily through our partners. Um, industry events, you might have seen uh, us doing matchmaking conferences in the last years with the likes of uh, Google, the Alliance for Rural Electrification, Solar Power Europe, um, and, and many others. Um, we also have a, a component on information and data. If you go on our website, uh, you can, for example, find 
a funding database where uh, we've tried to map out all the funding instruments that operate uh, in Africa and the partner countries on renewable energy. And I think right now the number in the database stands at more than 130 or even more than 150 different instruments. And that already speaks to the necessity of the program because um, it's very difficult for individual developers to navigate this uh, uh, myriad uh, um, long list of different financing opportunities and find really the right uh, financier for their uh, project. One thing I don't want to uh, omit here is that um, lately the European Commission, based on the work we've done in the past, um, has asked us to um, also act as the Team Europe one-stop shop for green energy investments where we specifically also support companies in accessing European financing instruments. Uh, and that is also obviously for us a great honor uh, to function as, as this um, specific um, entity. Um, more info on this can naturally be found also on our website. Now, let me briefly delve into um, our, our core services. Um, finance access advisory, what we call the Get Invest Finance Catalyst is, uh, in short, a leading, open, scalable, and flexible TA facility that provides on-demand advisory to get projects and businesses ready for finance and then link them with financiers, well, resulting also for the financiers in more pipeline and faster progress in deploying the uh, funds in question. As mentioned earlier, we have been operating this now for roughly well, almost eight years now. And since then, we have had almost 1,000 applications for support. And I want to let that rest just for a second. Uh, we are talking about renewable energy projects in very different and difficult markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. And still, even our small facility had over 1,000 applications. So that shows how dynamic the market is already uh, across the different market segments. Of these 930 uh, projects, roughly, we have selected 230 uh, for support or 230 uh, the support has been concluded. And right now we are actively supporting over 100 projects and companies uh, to, to access finance. Uh, 73 have been successfully uh, forwarded into a financier and 40 of those have by now reached uh, financial close, resulting in an uh, investment of about 270 million. Again, these numbers are across all the renewable energy segments. And I know we speak today about uh, hydrogen, but just to give you an overview on the facility, because that entire service package is, as of late last year, also open for hydrogen, just to give context on why, why I speak about this on hydrogen. Um, how are we delivering this? You know, it's not GIZ employees, it's not uh, political scientists like myself who, who do that advisory, um, but we have a, a really uh, strong team of 25 plus uh, advisors that have really uh, long standing experience in doing exactly this kind of transaction support. Uh, and they stand also ready to support your project free of charge um, if you're interested, but more on the, on the exit modalities uh, in, in a moment. Um, as mentioned, you know, support covers everything from improving the business case, financial structuring, finding the right finance, but also negotiations. Um, don't want to spend too much time here. You know, we will have some time for questions in a moment. So if you want to know more about specific aspects here, just let me know. I'm happy to elaborate further. Uh, one of the things we are particularly proud of is that we have just recently launched a second advisory facility, and that is the um, finance readiness support. That is, in essence, very similar to the finance catalyst, but this year targets exclusively locally owned and locally managed companies uh, in partner countries and uh, offers also an expanded service mandate. So we delve much more deeply into the company, provide business development support, uh, and help these companies, um, you know, start their journey towards scaling. Now, often enough, uh, we, we, we support them in their first formal uh, investment. So um, that, that is for these companies always a, a big step forward. Um, very new service. We've only just started with an initial cohort of 15 companies. Um, very promising and very interesting companies. And you can see on the right here, uh, we are working with a very um, well-established and, and in the sector also well-known team of, of consultancies that is actually deploying the advisory. Um, now, specifically on hydrogen, 
you know, having having listened to, to uh, Matt's excellent uh, presentation in the beginning of today's session, I don't want to spend too much time on the state of the market in Africa. I think the panelists and Matt have made a much better case uh, in much better effort in explaining where the market stands. Um, but I think everybody is well aware that it's early stage and we are only now starting in the piloting phase, but it's also a diverse market with various uh, medium-sized projects, bigger-sized projects, um, and, and a lot of challenges still, but also a lot of opportunities. Um, we as Get Invest, we have been approached by our donors, uh, also specifically the European Commission, with a request to um, explore how we as a facility can also serve hydrogen projects in the future. And we've been very glad to, to, to start work on this and, um, you know, deploy our, our proven set of advisory support also for that specific market segment. And you might have seen that in the chat uh, earlier today, uh, Michael Feldner, one of the 25 uh, advisors here, uh, is also today with us and, um, you know, also is available for, for any questions or if you have a project that you want to pitch, please feel free to reach out to me or to Michael um, and we are, we are more than happy to, to start a discussion and um, see how we can support this. Um, I don't want to, to omit that we've also um, established specific uh, partnerships on hydrogen. One is with the International Power to X Hub in Berlin. Uh, if you've been a, a participant yesterday already, um, you will have uh, listened to uh, Frank Mischler, who is uh, one of the, the finance advisors on their end. Uh, and they have also been jointly with our partner Solar Power Euro instrumental in, in helping us at Get Invest really shape our, our hydrogen window and make sure that, uh, that we hit the ground running here. I've, I've saved the best for last, and that is that uh, right now we already have two hydrogen projects under advisory. Um, one is in Sub-Saharan Africa. I can't speak too much about this because it's still in the very early stages and the developers are also keen to keep, keep tabs on the details at this point. But it's a very um, interesting approach uh, where, they, where they consider a phased approach of going from a single digit megawatt capacity uh, over, you know, something like 30 megawatt electrolyzer capacity to ultimately a much higher scenario in the coming years. Um, the other project I can say a bit more about uh, that is actually in the Caribbean and is a, a project which is tied into a solar project in Barbados where hydrogen is being used as a storage solution for a 40 megawatt um, hydrogen plant, uh, sorry, the photovoltaics plant. And where we have been now successful in uh, mobilizing an equity investment uh, into that project. So that's, that's already very encouraging to see that there are first successes on that front already. Um, at the bottom, you can see the um, website address where you can apply for the advisory support. Um, also, just feel free to drop by on our website uh, or contact me directly and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. And let's say we are uh, very keen and, and looking very much forward uh, to working more on hydrogen in the future. Uh, and I also uh, want to use this opportunity to give special, special thanks to uh, our uh, contributors at DG INPA and the member states uh, in the European Union who've made all this possible and who um, give us great support in, in setting up of this. That already concludes my small presentation. Um, I'm happy for any questions and happy to discuss uh, any, any requests for clarifications you might have. Uh, and with this, thank you very much and thanks for listening. Uh, I will hand now back over to John. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander. Um, yes, very, very brief presentation indeed when we look at uh, the entire portfolio of themes uh, that you guys are um, responsible for. Um, but actually, this is good because uh, this gives us some time to, to address some questions. Um, and we have several questions uh, specifically for you. Um, first, I would like to take uh, the question from Leonardo. Uh, because I think it's, um, it will lead to an important uh, um, precision that you might need to, to make, Alexander. So Leonardo's question is, does GetInvest finance the whole hydrogen project, including the renewable energy source electricity plants, or are those excluded? Um, so maybe you might want to, to, to re-explain again um, the nature of the support you provide. Um, support for getting financing as opposed to financing projects, maybe. Exactly, John. So basically, you've provided the answer already. Um, I, I might have, had, I might need to be a bit more specific on this in the future. 
Get Invest as a GIZ program is a technical assistance program. We offer advisory and support. We don't offer money. You know, we we link you up with the uh, with the guys with the money in order to uh, to put it not to find a point on this. You know, out there there's a lot of facilities from the DFIs from other actors that are looking to finance hydrogen projects, and it's bound to be a lot more in the future. You know, and a lot more facilities are in the process of being set up. And we as Get Invest, we can help you um, find these financiers and then also help you get, get into the door of the financier and assist you in negotiating with that financier. And we support, in fact, the entire um, uh, hydrogen project that can include the renewable energy component, you know, whatever is needed, basically, you know, if, uh, if, if you need support on, on that entire financing package, um, we can certainly also support you on the entire package, no problem. I would like to, to play devil's advocate a little bit. Uh, you said you do it for free. Why? What's it for you? <laughs> what motivates you? Well, we, as GIZ, you know, we are a taxpayer funded uh, uh, entity and it's basically the governments and the European Union uh, that, that has an interest in generating these impacts and that uh, wants to support Africa in its energy transition and also help set up a hydrogen infrastructure and economy in Africa with a view to all the benefits this has for you know, clean energy uh, provision, but also employment and economic development. Um, and the thanks and the, the interest is really on the side of the governments that fund us. We are just the implementing agency that, uh, let's say, has the honor of, of being able to work on this. But, um, you know, it's all down to, to the European governments that provide us with, with funds to do this. Do you have a, <clears throat> do you have like a, a typical, um, typical type of company that you like to assist or do you see out of the 930 companies that you've already assisted that there is somewhat of a trend in, in, in terms of the, uh, the kind of company, the history, the, the, the number of uh, staff? For example, I'm asking this question because we, we have Ladisto who is uh, asking a question about how can we get technical support for um, solar farms in order to produce ammonia for fertilizer. Um, is there really like something um, specific that you are looking for at the moment in terms of application and, and team or is it always broad and really based on whatever comes in your plan? Well, in, in terms, when you look at the entire renewable energy sector, I think the experience that the last eight years have, have told us is um, there is no standard type of company. You know, depending on the market in question and also the business model in question, uh, it's a very diverse setup. You know, it can be everything from small companies with a very focused business model on, on a sub-segment all the way to, we've worked with some of the largest developers in Europe um, um, doing, you know, grid connected projects in, in, in Africa. Um, <coughs> but um, I think where, where our, our sweet spot maybe ends, let's say, or where, where, where our support becomes a bit less relevant is with the very large projects. So when you talk about the, the mega scale, giga scale projects, both in, especially, especially in hydrogen, but also in, uh, in, in, in renewable energy, um, they're, they're, these guys don't need us necessarily, the type of support that we offer, right? Some may, but many don't, right? But um, we have also tried to design our support in a way that it is so flexible that we deploy only what you need. You know, if, 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 you, if your need is really primarily in navigating the funding landscape and you don't need any support in, uh, you know, business model revision, financing modeling revision or transaction support in the negotiations, we can also simply assist you in navigating this jungle of financing instruments and point you towards the right doors. Um, and we also have a lot of you know, networks and partnerships with financiers these days um, that, that value our support and, and you know, also are, are grateful when we forward uh, applications. Let me maybe spend one sentence also on hydrogen specifically. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very much with, with Matt's uh, initial argument here in the beginning that in the short term, 
um, substituting already existing uh, off-taker infrastructures uh, for gray hydrogen now with green hydrogen, be it in the ammonia fertilizer sector or other related uh, sectors, is probably for the next couple of years also in Africa uh, the most uh, uh, tangible segment where we will see quick, uh, quick developments and, and, and quick action. Uh, whereas many of the other uh, segments will take a bit longer to, to, to develop. And um, yeah, but honestly, one reason that, that we are here today is also to learn what is going on, because my feeling is also that uh, across the vast continent of Africa, um, one cannot be aware of all the projects that might already be under development. And we are very happy to learn more about what is out there and uh, offer our support uh, wherever it fits and is desired, let's say. Sure that uh, you'll get a few emails uh, after uh, today's presentation, um, because again, judging from from the comments, there's uh, quite a few entrepreneurs uh, listening to to this conference over the past two days, and so hopefully this will lead to some interesting conversations. Um, we have um, we have a question from Amy. Amy, I'm so happy to see you back. Thanks for joining us. Um, Amy is wondering if you assist mostly technology companies or if you are also focused on, on project developers. Um, th that depends a bit on what as a technology company you need. You know, um, if I would say reach out to us, let's have a conversation, let's see what your what your desire is, and let's see how we can help. Um, I would say at this stage, especially in the hydrogen uh, market, uh, we are we are even more flexible than we are in renewable energy, where um, there is a lot going on. In hydrogen, there is not that much going on. And if we have a project in question or a technology provider in question that has certain needs, just reach out to us, let's, let us have a conversation and we'll be happy to see uh, how we can support. I would definitely not rule it out. And then summarizing a question that has come from, uh, from different people, is there a requirement to work with European companies or to procure European equipment to uh, benefit from your services? No, that is not the case. Short answer is no. <laughs> I mean, we as a European program, we are obviously always happy to work uh, and, and foster partnerships with, between the European industry and African industry partners, um, but there is no such uh, uh, hard requirement on our end. What there is as a requirement is, however, that it should be uh, commercially motivated. You know, we are, uh, our mandate is to mobilize investment and, and, and foster um, private sector engagement in these sectors. Um, so there should be some form of a commercial interest. It shouldn't be fully charity based, which I think in hydrogen is not a big question, but in off-grid solar, for example, that's sometimes the uh, point. But no, there is no such requirement. Yeah. Um... Looking at the next question for you, um, do you offer pure advisory service um, next to um, the advisory focused on finding the right financing partner? Uh, so that's a question from Pascal. I hope Pascal, I, I understand your, your question correctly. Um, I guess it's more technical advisory, technology advisory. Uh, is this something you also can assist with at get invest, or is this a separate section of uh, the program? That that I would say is is something we can assist with indirectly because uh, let's say our uh, team of advisors is really from the finance side of things. You know, they are they are cracks in in, in structuring your series uh, equity series or finding the right debt investment for you. But they are not necessarily cracks in technology solutions. Um, however, that's exactly why we have the partnership with the international PTX hub in Berlin, where Frank and his team, and especially the the head of program over there, Thorsten Schwab, have a very good overview where different technology suppliers across the world are currently standing in developing uh, a variety of technology solutions in the, in the hydrogen context. And we would be happy to link you up with, uh, with, with the friends at, at PTX and see how we can uh, answer questions you might have. Oh, and I've got uh, Samuel here. That's an interesting question. Um, can GetInvest provide 
support or technical support to traditional authorities and NGOs to mobilize the communities and to develop more uh, opportunities in, in, uh, in their space. So this time, more from the uh, authorities and, and public side of things. Is that also something that you get involved with? Not necessarily. Our mandate does really not in include, you know, public sector support and working with with government authorities. Um, there are, however, other other entities that that do this type of work. Um, so when it comes to let's say working on the regulatory framework side of things, there is, for example, the European Technical Assistance Facility that works on such aspects. Uh, but we also have a sister program called Get Transform which is uh, doing uh, somewhat similar work uh, on the GIZ side for, for public sector regulatory frameworks. Um, when it comes to uh, community mobilization, um, I would say, you know, this we also cover indirectly by way of our, you know, events, workshops, webinars, and, and mobilization efforts that we do. Uh, but here the aim really is, is for us primarily to, to spread the word about our services and, and you know, also um, link, link companies and financiers already uh, that way, by way of having these matchmaking events and services. So I, I'm afraid on that front, not directly, but um, I'm happy to point to uh, several other stakeholders that do this type of work. Um, yeah. Also, you know, bilateral programs of GIZ in the respective country might also be a better contact point for this than, than us. Here. And then the last question for you, which I believe is, a, is an easy question, uh, but let's see. Uh, Emiliano is wondering if, uh, based on your experience, you see any possibility for a private project in the hydrogen area uh, that would fulfill the criteria and be eligible for funding. So fulfill the criteria to be supported by you and then in the end uh, be commercially viable enough to, to attract funding? Well, on the, on the first question, definitely. I mean, we have already two hydrogen projects that we do support and we are sure there will be more out there. And as you said, I hope to get many emails in the coming days to, to expand our portfolio on that front. And, um, you know, being eligible for funding, I would be very optimistic here, you know, that, that also with, the, with ever more financing instruments coming online for, for hydrogen projects and with the commitments in the European Union, but also North America and other places of the world, hydrogen will be one of the main sectors that these development financiers will be looking at in the coming years. So availability of money will not be a problem. What we need to achieve then is that we match the development stages of the, final, uh, the, the private sector, the, the stage in which these development projects are when they come to the financier's door, with the requirements of the financier in terms of due diligence and whatnot, in order for both to match. But um, given what we've experienced in renewable energy um, over the last 10 years, I'm optimistic that you know that will be achieved. The question here is mostly on timetable. You know, how quickly can that happen? And, and that depends partly also on the developers. You know, how quickly can they advance their projects, secure off-takers, find technology solutions that work and, and come to a, to a financial model that, that is viable and that, that bankers find investable, frankly. And I think, um, in principle, I'm very hopeful on that point. Well, uh, I suggest we finish on this uh, note of uh, very strong optimism. Um, I think that's a good summary of the last two days that we, uh, that we've had now with the different speakers, identifying opportunities, also some challenges, but uh, great prospects um, for, the, for the green hydrogen opportunity in Africa. And this concludes our conference. Um, so I would like to thank our partners once again, uh, to thank uh, the different speakers who have accepted to, to join us and to uh, share a little bit of their knowledge with the audience. And then last but not least, I would like to thank um, all the listeners who took some time away from their busy schedule. Um, it's always great to, to be in touch with you and to see that so many of you are, are following us and participating in our events. And um, this is it. Thank you to my team as well for the support in organizing these events. And I wish you all an excellent rest of the day and look forward to welcoming you again in our next event. Thank you.